The first scripture I will be reading is from Judges 11, verses 30, 31, 34, and 35. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites shall be the Lord to be offered up by me as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah and there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and with dancing. She was his only child. He had no son or daughter except her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble for me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet... He liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on the platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Integrity, honor, values, ethics, principled leadership. What kind of leader are you in your home, in your workplace, in the community, in your faith community? Do you bend to the whims of popular opinion or do you take principled stands? This is gonna be a squirm sermon, can you feel it? All right, but it, it's an equal opportunity squirm, we're all gonna feel it by the end. We have in our scripture lessons two stories of two men who made foolish vows and rather than admit their foolishness, they doubled down. Jephthah, in our passage from Judges, even has the audacity to blame his daughter after he makes this ludicrous promise to God. I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out the door if I am, uh, of my house when I get home if I am successful in battle. 
he was thinking maybe a chicken was going to come out his door, which would not have been uncommon, a duckling, a goat, but alas, he says, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble to me. And everyone together go, <laughs> take responsibility for yourself, please. Jewish Midrash, which is rabbis, you know, writing commentary about scripture, talk about this passage as the foolish vow. We're not to emulate Jephthah or admire the fact that he's a man of his word. We're meant to realize the stupidity of making such a vow in the first place. Don't be like Jephthah. And don't be like Herod Antipas either, who drunkenly, foolishly promises uh, his daughter, I will give you whatever you wish up to half of my kingdom to someone who would ask for the head of someone that, that he admires on a platter. I, I can see him saying, no, sweetheart, I meant jewelry. You know, or, or I'll name a city after you, not murder. Herod was a Jew. And maybe he imagined himself like King Ahasuerus from the book of Esther, who made the same promise to, to Esther, ask her whatever you wish up to half of my kingdom. And maybe he thought his daughter would step up to the plate with this noble response. If that was his dream, he was rudely awakened. And by the way, there's some debate about Herod's uh, motivations in history. Josephus, who is a first century historian, uh, wrote that it was all, it was political. He saw that the influence that John the Baptist was having, that people were just hanging on every word and that if he had wanted to lead an uprising, he could have. And that was the reason why, why Herod had John the Baptist killed. He wasn't tricked into it. It was politically expedient. But it resonates with Jesus' death, right? The fear that he would, he, would, he would lead an uprising against Rome. And if we compare the two scripture stories, there's all the, the similarities in that as well. Two powerful men who have sympathy for the victim but do nothing. Pontius Pilate washes his hands. And here Herod says, okay, off with his head. Pilate gives into what's popular. Herod gives into what? A false sense of honor. Or if we believe Jos Josephus, the historian, power at all costs, sacrificing his honor. If someone asks for something that goes against your morals, your values, you say no. And that's where I got all of us. Because all of us have done something that haunts us when we did something that we knew wasn't right, or we didn't do something when we saw something going on and somebody needed to do something and you didn't do it. It's part of being human. Welcome to humanity. And welcome to a community of faith that believes that God can make miracles out of our mistakes. But, who calls us to, be to do better the next time, again and again, doesn't lower the bar, thank God, but also doesn't give up on us. And can use that haunting to make us better people. This is a cautionary tale, and each of us can tell our own story. God would say, use that experience, that feeling, of when you did nothing or when you went along with something that you know wasn't right to make a different choice the next time. Our history as a people screams, learn from me. Scripture screams, learn from me. Principled leadership takes a stand based on, on values. This is what I believe. This is what I believe God would want in this situation, in these circumstances, and then acts accordingly. But also, when we have been convicted that we were mistaken, that what we once believed was, was a God thing, where we realized, oh my gosh, uh -uh, we were wrong, admits the mistake and tries to make it right. That's also godly. 
There have been so many things in our history as a nation and as a church where we have said and done things in the name of Jesus and in the name of God that were not of Jesus and not of God. And we can be like Herod and, and, uh, and behead the person crying repent. Or we can be strong and brave, faithful and true by listening and learning, owning our mistakes and, and pledging to do better the next time, to make things right. This is our life's work. You know, we pray every week that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. This is our life's work. And it will take principled leadership. Now, there are many, many examples that in, in, in the culture and going on in the world that, that we could tackle in, in bringing this to, to, to modern day. Uh, and there's so, and I think there are things so much bigger than what I'm going to talk about. But because this is something that we're going to have to muddle through as 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 a church, and the leadership of the church is going to have to do. Let's talk about coming back together, um, as we as we hopefully are coming out of the on the other side of of the pandemic. It was so easy when it was all or nothing, right? You're either. We, you know, we're either all together or we're all home, but now we've got this, how do, how do we do this? To sing with masks or not to sing, to wear a mask, not to wear masks. The session meets monthly and we will discuss again whether to relax some of the precautions that we put in place, informed by the advisory committee uh, that, that you have also put in place as a church. But principal leadership makes decisions based on values not based on what's popular or what will make the most people happy. What are the values in, in this discussion? Now, I'm going to list some. If you have others, please, please let me know. Email me or talk to somebody on the session because these are the ones that, that I have, that I think of and I think that other people are thinking about. But there are other, if there are other ones, please let me know. Safety is a value. Inclusion is a value. Can everyone participate? Elderly and firm, children, families. I think comfort is a value. Tradition is a value. And, and they're not all weighted the same, right? For, you know, for me, safety is high. My personal comfort is low on that. So yet they're not all weighted the same. But these are some of the values that we bring to this discussion. I would ask you to think personally for yourself what are the values that are guiding your opinion about how the church should manage itself during these extraordinary times? For you to discern that for yourself, what are the values at work for you? Here's the thing. It's impossible to make everybody happy. If we mask, some won't come. If we don't mask, others won't. If uh, some are advocating an honor system uh, so that if folks who are, not, who are not vaccinated, that they would wear a mask. And, and I would say to you, people, human nature, people do not like to, to stand out. And then, and then I mean, you know, can you imagine sending away? You're not vaccinated? Why not? Do you want to go there and have those conversations? Because, I mean, and let's be honest. I mean, this is all akin to, you know, it's tied to our, the political divide in this country and, and the conversations around who you believe and who don't you believe. Do you trust the CDC? Do you trust the government? Where do you get your media? What is true? What is fact? This is part of what we have to contend with. Isn't this fun? I wouldn't wish this on anybody. And darn it all. I'm a pastor of the church. We need to pray. Pray for wisdom. Pray for patience. Pray for unity, for community, and that we might disagree in love. And this, I put a little star next to. Pray that our leaders might lead with integrity, clear about their values, 
and honored by the community that has called them to the responsible positions of leadership. May they look to God to make the right decisions. And may we as a church recognize when we get it wrong, be willing to own it, admit it, and then try to make things right. Do better the next time. Let us be self-effacing and of good humor. And may God cover all that we say and do with grace. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen. You are invited to stand as we uh, affirm our faith through the confession of Belhar. Let us begin. We believe that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice, so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. That the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged. That in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. <laughs> 